Thank you very much, Professor Keller. Um, yes, I, I agree that um, nowadays, maybe uh, what we knew before about the standards of uh, uh, fiction production uh, will have to change drastically, no? Because um, nowadays, I think with a very small crew, uh, like um, a documentary crew, you will be more capable of making uh, a movie considering this, this situation. Thank you very much, Professor Keller. Yes? Sorry, one, one, one last thing that it just reminds me of um, because of thinking about the safety of that crew and, and why, it's, why it's difficult um, to, you know, because you know, the, the production company can be sued at this point if you know, people get sick on set and die, for example, but it's interesting because in the US, there's a relief package that is being considered by, um, by the Senate um, and it has been stalled for a long period of time. And one of, the, one of the things that it's being stalled over is the right of a business um, to be able to ask their employees to sign a disclosure saying that if they get sick, then they can't sue the company. Um, so it has it has an impact on you know the 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 labor force that's being asked to work in these kinds of conditions too. I just I'm sorry I wanted to add that too. For sure, yeah, very interesting remark. Thank you, Professor Keller. Uh, Professor More. Situation in Mexico is a complicated one in many senses because if we consider the production chain, including the film schools, which mean it would be like film studies, then film production, accessing to the industry. We have the, the part where the film is made, production, the part where the film is distributed, distribution, and the part where the film is exhibited as some sort of way of refinancing films. And the film schools prepare people to do films in a more efficient way and with much more creativity, the production the needs investments, which should come from this distribution and exhibition. The problem in Mexico is that the first uh, law of cinematography, which was uh, 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 created in, in the year 4950, uh, meant that the distribution uh, of Mexican films and the exhibition of Mexican films would take about 50% of the screens in the country, which meant also there was sort of a state control on distribution by COTSA and well, like Películas Mexicanas and Mexican Films, which was the name of the company that would distribute internationally which had a big market in the United States, especially in Chicago. They had Mexican uh, theaters that only showed Mexican films, you know, Latin America. And they had the national distribution by Películas Nacional, National Films, which would feed all of these theaters that were even in the smallest uh, towns in Mexico, uh, which meant that the Mexican audience was a popular audience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was part of the basic, uh, I don't know how you say, canasta basica, well, like the basic uh, spend that the people made, which included food, which included medicine, included also the uh, film tickets. So it was really a very wide distribution, inclusive of the large section of the country that re rejected American films. They were not interested in seeing American films. We were only interested in seeing Mexican films. The situation started to collapse uh, at the end of the 80s when the production of films was only interesting and in getting money back from the, from the box office. So very poor quality, sexy comedies, films were shot. The only interest was in refinancing the, the production. The production was in control of the producers, which were about, I don't know, 90 producers associated, and they would like 
get the money and reinvest it in their films. Then came the free trade agreement in the 90s, which changed completely the situation because the cultural production was included as a merchandise instead of being excluded as it was in Canada and in countries like in France and I think also in England. So the Mexican films became products that would compete with Hollywood productions. That meant that, the, and also the national exhibit distribution and exhibiting companies closed down, shut down, and the big theaters lost their audiences. Especially those uh, uh, theaters in small towns, they would not receive any more Mexican films and the big multiplex uh, companies started appearing. And they would reduce their showings only to people with higher income, which meant that only 15% of Mexican population can afford to go to the, to the cinemas, which the tickets became very, very expensive. So the kind of audience in Mexico changed from being a popular to be a sort of an elite audience uh, of the middle class. So we stopped having a popular cinema and start having like a cinema made, made by and for the middle class. In order to finance these films, uh, the problem was that in the competition with Hollywood productions, there was no way to refinance films. So most of the private producers stopped making films. So the state had to create some kind of funds. First, it was the, the Fomento al Cine de Calidad, the fund to uh, uh, impo impulse quality films, which afterwards became the Mexican Film Institute Fidesine, which, well, there were three funds, one for, uh, let's say, art film, one for commercial films, and the third one, it was the open participation of uh, the private uh, companies that instead of paying taxes, they would be able to invest in filmmaking. So this sort of opened a way for production but the exhibition was completely out of the question. The situation became to such a point that also Mexico is the fourth uh, place in the world ranking of film theaters under China, United States and India. The Mexican films would only have about 15% of the of theaters and the producers would only receive about seven percent of the box office which which is impossible to make a film with that kind of money and most of the profits from box office went to the american producers so this situation which provided on one side the possibility of make making a lot of films. I don't know, I think uh, the last year of Peña Nieto, there was about 200 and something films made, were films that didn't have a place to be shown. These films went all over the world, festivals and, and prices, and the most prestigious festivals, I know Berlin and Cannes and, and, uh, and, uh, and Venice, yeah, if they even got prices in, in the, in the Indie Film Festival in the States, uh, South Lake City, the Sundance Film Festival, but they were not shown in Mexico. And there are many films that are, after running through festivals, well, they just simply are canned. So this was the situation before the pandemic. When the pandemic struck, situations got worse. First of all, because the government, the, the Congress under the, uh, excuse that there was corruption inside its funds, simply canceled all the funds, which was just happened. So not only film production stopped because of the pandemic, the film production is gonna stop because there's no way 
to finance it. The only, it, it, it only does, the only thing that does is opens completely the market to American films, which will now, I think the American Motion Picture Association is very happy that this thing happened because they're practically canceling production in Mexico. We hope that our Congress will sort of think it over, but uh, it doesn't seem like that. So besides the, the horrible situation that the production was, with no access to distribution and exhibition in our own country, it also, well, well let's hope that it doesn't shut down completely because of this, of this situation. I think I, I, I'll stop here and let the other participants continue. Thanks very much, uh, Professor Mora. Uh, Jess, uh, uh, the situation of Mexican cinema is now getting through, we, we can say like in dark times uh, about what's happening with this uh, public uh, funding, you no, know, from, from the governmental, uh, from the Mexican governmental institutions. Mm, well, uh, the, uh, unfortunately, we are running uh, out of time, uh, Professor Huang. Um, I uh, I give you the uh, the floor now, and I would like to invite uh, some students to make uh, some questions. I think we only have time for two questions because we have to close the program uh, more or less in in this time. So, Professor Huang, uh, I, uh, I give you the floor. Oh, I hope to my students. So here is the Zhu Wenyi. Yeah, could you answer, uh, ask some questions for us? Or Wang Xingying, Wang Xingying, or some, ask some questions. My student, uh, who is here? <laughs> okay, Wang Xingying. Hi. <laughs> uh huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Um, yeah. uh, hi. hi, everyone. I'm a PhD student from Shanghai University and I major in film study. So I have a question um, about um, things I heard all of the professor talk about new phenomena from uh, since the pandemic uh, all over the world. So my question is, does this um, change our approaches, like how to think about um, film in the pandemic time? Like, are, do we have some new methodology since the pandemic happened? Um, I, just, I just want to hear professors talk about this. Thank you. I think that we have to create a new method because obviously the way uh, the film of production is being approached, I don't know, with all the security measures, well, in Mexico, we increase the budgets in 20 to 40%. And there's no way to recuperate that. If, if before in Mexico, it was very difficult. Now today, it's, it's going to be almost impossible. Also, there's a lot of substitution of the theaters and films by the small screen, you know, with these companies like Netflix or Amazon that have become like world uh, monopolies and which also they need a lot of material. The, the conditions in which they buy this material are very negative because they buy completely the film. So I was listening to a, a director of the film archives in Mexico saying, suddenly we're gonna make Mexican films to which we will have no access. Yeah, because they will be in the power of these companies and somebody referred to them as black holes, you know. They buy your film, if they wanna show, they show it. If they don't wanna show, they don't show it. So the idea of uh, relying of, on these uh, platforms as a way of distributing and showing films has a lot of, of problems for, for filmmaking. So I believe we will have to develop 
a completely new approach about, about the way we go in making and distributing films. Thanks, Professor Mora. Professor Keller, I don't know if you want to add something about this question. Yeah, I would, I would love to at least briefly um, say almost the opposite, but um, with great respect, because I think you know, you're speaking from the point of view of, of um, production of films. And I'm, I'm thinking um, more in terms of um, being a film scholar um, and thinking about how to approach the cinema um, in the time during and after a pandemic. And I say, you know, this is, this is actually the topic of my book that I just finished. It's, it's about the resilience of cinema as a phenomenon. If we think about cinema as only one thing, you know, like you go to a movie theater and you watch a film projected on a very large screen with a group of people who are all talking too loud and, you know, eating a lot of popcorn and candy. Then, then yes, I think cinema is bound to change, but it, it's never been only that. It's, it's always been a shape-shifting, fluid, resilient phenomenon, and it will find a way. It's like, it's like the line in Jurassic Park, right? Like life will find a way, cinema will find a way. Somehow it will find a way around the pandemic, through the pandemic, it will reflect the pandemic and yes, um, definitely production circumstances are likely to change. And I, and I take that extremely seriously. I don't mean to diminish that in any way by saying this, but, but I think people will find a way to get films made and, and they might look a little bit different and they might act a little bit different, but they, they will remain. I think it's an art form that is of our time and that we you know, need to depend upon through this time. Thanks very much, Professor Keller. In a certain way, you are answering the, the last question of this uh, conversatory. And we'll have time for a last uh, question from one of your students. Thank you very much. I would also like to ask a question afterwards. <laughs> for sure, Professor Juarez. Gabriela, huh? thank you. Yes. Um, so. I'm reflecting a little more on like the in-person networking in the film industry, particularly around film festivals and, and how film festivals and, and submissions and, and, and going there in person has been a way for for new filmmakers like like myself to to really like get your foot in the game and 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 meet people and watch other people's films that you probably would have never found on the internet because they're not available virtually um, for certain reasons. And I'm also thinking about, I don't know, like in the history of film, we've always seen a disproportionate accessibility between like women, men and class and, and how we, how do we, how do y'all see that potentially transforming um, and in either negative or, or positive ways because the last film festival I participated in was virtually and honestly was a filmmaker who had a film, you know, be, like screened during the film festival. I couldn't even, I didn't even have a, the attention span to stay throughout the whole thing or even want to network with people because it's just like, I don't want to be in my computer for seven hours or six hours. and. It's just like sometimes I get cut up with, with with what's happening on my own life that I just forgot that my film was being screened and I didn't even, I didn't even go to my own screening. Um, so yeah, my question is, I mean, I've, I've kind of experienced it firsthand, but like, how do you see that potentially like impacting it, the film industry in a, in a long term, long term? So uh, can I uh, give an example? Because in China, uh, right now uh, we are recover, uh, <clears throat> recovery, uh, uh, recover uh, uh, for the filming, uh, and uh, uh, generally uh, <clears throat> big crew, big film crew uh, is uh, is beginning to produce some movies. So I hope I think uh, most of, uh, generally China uh, uh, control the. Uh, situation, bad situation. So 
uh, most uh, plays began their originally, uh, generally uh, began their uh, normal life and uh, began their normal work and uh, began our <clears throat> our uh, study in the campus. And uh, our students can uh, make movies, make short films, and uh, in the uh, our campus or sometimes other place. So I think uh, uh, maybe uh, quickly uh, the the world the world will be recovery. Uh, I think uh, recover. Uh, I think uh, it's not be a long time. Okay, that's what I think. Yes, I think it's very optimistic. I don't know if Professor Mora or Professor Keller have something to add to the last question. Well, I think that the going online after March has also provided a lot of new venues for not only for, for production, for, but for showing films, because now it's possible to have uh, access to a lot of material that before it was very difficult to get at. There have been many companies, uh, distribution companies, the government agencies that have put a lot of films for free in the net and you can watch them at any time in the day. And also there's a lot of uh, panels, discussions like this one that you can have access to uh, at any time of, of the day or of the week or of the month. So those are advantages that didn't exist before. So I believe that there's gonna be some way of taking advantage of this uh, uh, internet situation, of this online situation that I hope it won't disappear after, or hope the pandemic is over. Well, I would, I would just briefly piggyback on what you've said, which I think is, you know, Gabriella, I think it is addressing something that's really important, which is it turns out that, you know, movies are human, like a, a human endeavor, you know, like we miss audiences around us. We miss face-to-face -face interaction on every possible level. Um, but I think exactly as Juan is saying, you know, it also this is introducing new opportunities as well. And, and we're realizing some of the things that we can deal with and some of the things that we can't deal with. And, you know, being on a screen all day long, I cannot deal with. At the same time, I'm deeply grateful for the opportunities. I, I, I've gone to more festivals this year than I ever have. And, and my experience of them is different and, and not as good, I think, on, on a fundamental level. However, I got to experience them. And, and I, think, I think that's a, a real gift. You know, I, I wouldn't have been able to go to Italy and you know, to, um, to Toronto to, you know, and, and to all kinds of places that had little festivals all over the world um, and see these kinds of films that are being released, I think because there's pressure for archives and other entities to figure out ways to reach people still. Um, and so I hope we'll have both of those things at some point. I hope we'll have exactly, uh, you know, on my screen, I'm right in between um, the other two distinguished professors who represent, you know, uh, two different visions of optimism for the future. And, I, and I, I'm happy to be between them because I think, I think we can embrace both of those lines of optimism for the future. Uh, reminds me to this like uh, argue between uh, two mainstream directors, Christopher Nolan and Alfonso Cuaron, that Christopher Nolan thinks that uh, cinema uh, has to be uh, watched in the movies and film in evening, with, uh, still with motion picture film. And even though uh, a big production like uh, Alfonso Cuaron's Roma is also made to, 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 to see the movie in, in, in a theater, no? But uh, he believes that uh, it, the movies have to reach all the people and you can see for example here in China it's very common that when you go to the subway or, or to the bus everybody is watching some movies or some series in, in, in their way to go back home or, or to the office so I, I also believe that uh, cinema has endless possibilities and I think 
that's uh, a, a very good thing. Well, uh, now we're reaching to the end of our program, and I would like to be uh, to give the uh, 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 final closure remarks to the directors of UNAM Boston, Benjamin Juarez, and and to Guillermo Pulido. Um, uh, Professor Juarez has also a question, and then I will give the word to uh, Professor Pulido. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Juan, Professor uh, Keller, and Professor Mora. It was really a very de delightful conversation. Thank you, Pablo. And precisely my question is uh, to my dear friend, Guillermo Pulido, because we have been discussing uh, something that has to do not only with filmmaking, but with economics. And uh, uh, Guillermo being a person of culture, but also having uh, a solid uh, education in, in economics. Uh, how do you see the way to deal uh, with the uh, viability of storytelling through cinema when we have this uh, terrible uh, race in the cost, problems of distribution, and the force of uh, a few, a handful of mostly American companies uh, taking charge of the industry worldwide? And another question would be for uh, Professor Mora. And uh, well, you were just mentioning Alfonso Cuaron. He's one of the students of uh, Juan Mora Catlet, as well as Maria Novaro and uh, Manuel Lavetsky, and a list of 800 of the most uh, notable uh, uh, filmmakers in, in Mexico. And that is about the, um, uh, not a very good film, but interesting, um, El Año de la Peste play year done by uh, Casals with um, a, um, a script written by uh, Garcia Marquez and Jose Agustin that takes this book from uh, 1665, the plague of uh, Journal of the Plague in London to Mexico City in the 70s. And that at least for me has one great scene where the president is dealing with the minister of finance and uh, the secretary of the interior and the minister of tourism of how to deal politically with the plague. Usted lo sabe. Los medios de disuasión no nos faltan. De todos modos, estamos afrontando un grave problema de orden público. La protesta del gremio médico se generaliza hora con hora y numerosos sindicatos se preparan para respaldar. Algo hay que hacer. Quintanar, bueno, ¿qué puedo decir? Necesitaríamos, no sé, digamos, 20 años para reconstruir el turismo. De hecho, los daños actuales... So, um, these two questions for Juan Mora and for Guillermo Pulido. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Benjamin. I'm uh, very, very pleased to be able to participate in this, uh, in this gathering. I really appreciate your, your presentations, your comments. Uh, answering your, your, your question, uh, Benjamin, I, I, as an economist, I saw uh, that in this time, the global economy were uh, going down in the first uh, months uh, that all the governments and uh, companies and uh, universities uh, uh, scholars, they were all worried uh, about the, the future and about the disastrous uh, years to, to come. But I, I, I don't really believe in that. I don't really be believe in that. I believe in society. Mm -hmm. I believe in the organizations. I see in the different sectors, uh, uh, different kind of, of developments a marvelous kind of develops. I do believe that the, the film industry will find a way to really going all around uh, until find the same circle or maybe better than before. Mm. Uh, I can think about the whole kind of opportunities that the society develop in, this, in, this, in these times. So I really believe in that we will find, economically speaking, uh, the revealed 
of the economy of, of, of the economy of the film industry. We have been seeing all the unimaginable uh, things in this last year. I mean, in in everything, in everything, and it's amazing how's the economy going back slowly, 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 and how we found a new opportunities to develop the sectors. So uh, I I have a lot of, of, of questions, of, of course, of, of what the, the, the colleagues are, are saying, but I know that, that there is not, not, no time. So I just appreciate this, uh, uh, this program. Benjamin, thank you so much for calling us uh, to participate in this. Thank you, Hector. And of course, thank you, Pablo Mendoza all, and all the distinguished uh, participants. But my answer is yes, we will find the way. This is not the end. This is the new beginning. Thank you. Thank you, Benjamin. Gracias, Guillermo. Many, many thanks. And this is the first of many things that we will do together. But Professor uh, Juan Moracat, you have the last word. If you want to comment uh, about uh, this uh, film, that uh, is, is funny. But I mean, one part of the of the secret of resilience in the film industry is that we have people like you and people like Sarah and people like Professor Juan Wangli. So whatever you want to tell us. Well, first of all, I want to say that also Pablo Mendoza was, was one of my students and he did a beautiful <laughs> thesis <laughs> film that won an award, so. great person. Well, The Year of the Plague by Felipe Casas is one of this, uh, what do you call it? Um, dystopic films that are so much or were so much in vogue before the pandemic, before the real dystopy hit us. And it's a film that deals with the, with the idea that the uh, plague is running wild and everybody's trying to ignore it and trying to have fun while the city fills up with with dead bodies and horrible, yeah? But there's a lot of uh, similarity with the, with the reality. I don't know, Thanksgiving in the States, everybody went to celebrate, yeah? They didn't mind about the, the virus. And I hope this going from uh, December 12th to uh, January 6th in Mexico, which is called the Guadalupe Reyes because it starts on the birthday of the Virgin of Guadalupe and ends with the three kings and usually a time for consuming a lot of alcoholic beverages and going to parties. I don't know if it's possible to change that cultural uh, custom in Mexico. So let's hope we will have something like this to be that this film shows. And I was also thinking, it doesn't have to do directly with this, but I was also thinking the good thing of film being shown on the small screen, even the cellular and then the, uh, the mobile phones, is that it, this might be in a possibility to regain in Mexico the popular audiences. The audiences that don't have the money to go to these multiplexes, which are actually in, in a very, very dire situation at this point. So maybe the Mexican film will stop being only an, for an elite audience and will start again going back to the general public. That's, that's like my wish. Okay, thank you so much for letting me participate. No, thank you so much. Thank you, Professor Juan Juan Lee. Uh, thank you, Professor Keller. Uh, muchísimas gracias, Pablo. Muchísimas gracias, Guillermo. Muchísimas gracias, Hector. Y a todos ustedes que nos están escuchando, muchas gracias. To everybody who's watching us, thank you so much. And we will continue this conversation because I find it absolutely fascinating. And that's what we need, uh, words of resilience and of uh, starting a new chapter. Xie, xie. <laughs>